Hi, Jim Shaw here from uh, Crystal Group. Uh, welcome to another session of Jim on Engineering. And this this uh, time we're going to mix it up a little bit. I've got uh, some friends, um, some colleagues uh, here to uh, to um, kind of discuss um, what's going on on a motherboard in terms of um, the chips and the functionality that each one of these um, ICs or processing units really kind of um, uh, provides to the motherboard. So I've got Alan High here. Alan's a tech director uh, with Crystal Group. We have uh, Mike Steffen. Mike is an engineering uh, manager for the, for the team. And then Will Byers um, is here for um, our FPGA and software. So um, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Thank th thanks for participating. And, Glad uh, to be here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about uh, kind of the, the uh, you know, let me back up with the, with the CHIPS Act that's being um, created in Congress and with the emphasis on domestic supply of, of silicon, you know, that takes us to uh, kind of the next step and, and uh, what's going on in the board and how do you utilize those chips downstream from the $52 billion worth of investment that's going into the uh, U.S. economy in terms of the infrastructure associated with creating chips for this kind of industry. So we wanted to talk just a little bit about, hey, what's going on inside the board, what's going on on the board, and how do these chips, how do they work together um, to create um, that server class motherboard that, that uh, we so readily apply to a variety of different applications in, in, the, in the business. So. Um, the first thing, you know, is kind of a, a general layout, and, and maybe, maybe Alan, I could ask you to kind of provide a little bit of um, a dialogue or structure about um, what, what's on the board to begin with and, and uh, where they are and kind of point that out a little bit. Sure. So this is an example of a dual socket Intel motherboard. Um, basically, you've got your CPU sockets right here. You've got some memory slots. Um, you've got kind of the Northridge and connectivity area. Um, and then you, you've got your PCI slots and more devices up on this edge. Um, so they call them the Northridge now is the platform hub controller. controller right? Correct. Right. So the, um, Southbridge, Northbridge, those are kind of um, different terms, terms terms from from a while back, but um, very applicable today. Yeah, I, I, if you're old, you still call them Northbridge. <laughs> uh, but that would that, be for me, it's Northbridge. Yeah, for me as well. <laughs> uh, it shows how long I've been doing this stuff. Um, but uh, th that's basically it. Um, basically, connectivity here, CPU and memory right there. Um, you've got power inputs. Um, on this particular board, you've got um, chips to actually run the uh, power management kind of on these little daughter boards. Um, but otherwise, it basically just provides a lot of connectivity to these main CPU um, controllers. Okay. Gentlemen, anything to add to, to Alan's description there? I don't have anything. That was a pretty good overview. Yeah, we, we could go into great depth about the <laughs> hundreds of connectors, uh, yeah. but uh, from a high level view, that's that's uh, that's what pretty, it is. Pretty good. Should we focus for just a moment on the, the CPU side of things? Um, that is the main engine, um, basically. That's mm -hmm. that uh, that you're trying to capture um, and utilize on the board like this, um, and. With respect to the CPUs, you know, we're currently at um, Sapphire Rapids is, is what we're um, uh, starting to look at in terms of the implementation. And what are all the functions that are handled by the CPU? And maybe, maybe Mike, I'd ask you to just kind of give us a little bit of a background of what you think uh, or what, what are the functions associated with um, these server class CPUs sure. um, today? Um, so, as with any uh, processing unit, the the more the most core function of it is is computation. Uh, modern server class uh, CPUs are uh, on the order of twenty or more cores. Uh, in, in some of the cases of the of the larger uh, AMD processors that are out now. Um, so, what these are able to do is they're able to do um, complicated math. Uh, complicated I/O operations, uh, uh, memory-intensive uh, transfers to and from memory to and from uh, peripheral devices, 
um, and all the coordination that, that's involved therein. Um, and it can do it very quickly uh, and, and to some extent in parallel. Now it's not as parallel as, as uh, perhaps a, a GPU or a GPGPU application would be, um, but with the number of cores that are in there uh, on modern CPUs, uh, you can get a lot of done, lot done uh, in parallel at the same time. Well, and that seems to be a, a big trend right now is a lot of those, you know, higher compute functionalities are being pulled into that single die, so it's all, yeah. it's almost like a one-stop shop type deal. Yeah. So with Sapphire Rapids, I noticed that the minimum core count kind of went up. The clock rate is still running in the 2 to 2.5 gig mm -hmm. um, uh, range. Um, the core counts um, have gone from, I think uh, minimum is like, is 8 the minimum? I core? believe so. Yeah, 8 is the minimum core count. Um, and then you see that the frequency can change um, relative to, it's almost like there was a power cap that they've applied to the process, the CPU, so that um, these systems are designed to run faster um, with slower core counts. Have you guys kind of noticed that or is, am well, I making this up? Do we want to go into the technical explanation of that or? Sure. I mean, okay. the, well, the, the audience demands it. All right. All right. The basic trade-off, right, is if I have one lane of processing and I can run one thread at, let's say, two and a half gigahertz, mm -hmm. um, I have two and a half gigahertz of throughput on that one lane. Um, so now if I have, so in this case, a core is lane. If I now start introducing more cores, I'm gaining throughput through the parallelism of it versus the um, single lane of throughput. So one lane to go faster, you need a higher clock speed. More cores to go faster, you can add, add more cores or you can increase your clock speed. Um, and then from a design standpoint, the faster your clock is, the harder it is to actually design an IC that'll work and meet timing. Mm -hmm. And also um, the more heat or power. Yeah, heat dissipates. and power. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's probably easier to add more cores than it is to speed yeah. up the clock significantly. So I kind of noticed that there's this design, um, it's almost like a design goal of uh, somewhere between 150 and 230 watts um, for these processors, um, depending on kind of which which type of uh, rack unit this is going into, mm. like what, what size. Um, so that, that certainly makes it um, a challenge to provide cooling for, for all of that too. Um, it, Mike, you were talking about some of the functions that are now on kind of on the CPU um, and you know a lot of these like the PCIe lanes are basically driven um, off of those interfaces. Uh, NVMe is in there. What else is going on inside the, the CPU that um, kind of changes the way that um, the board is laid out? Probably the the biggest or widest interface uh, is the memory bus. Um, modern CPUs have have more than one lane of memory. Um, I believe this generation is four lanes and, and it's going up from there, um, giving you the parallel path to the, to the memory bus because that starts to be the bottleneck as well. Once you, once you get past a certain point in computation speed, um, actually getting mem uh, information to and from the main memory uh, ends up being a bottleneck. Um, so, so what uh, Intel and AMD and, and the processor vendors have all done is they've started to um, par parallelize that add more lanes, add, add wider lanes, so that you can get more in and out of memory uh, more quickly. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's also the, the di kind of the difference between a workstation board and a server class board, right, mm -hmm. is the amount of memory. Yeah, the, and the workstation mm -hmm. CPUs in particular uh, uh, are usually, usually have a wider memory bus, or a, a wider number of channels on the memory bus um, than, a, than a, C, uh, a workstation uh, CPU or a, or a embedded CPU would. Mm -hmm. You got one of the other differences is the connectivity from CPU to CPU. You don't usually find that in a workstation class um, or dual CPUs kind of a thing. So they have a, I, it used to be uh, QPI was yeah. the, what they called it. I don't remember what they call it now. So it's UPI now for UPI. Intel and, mm -hmm. and um, for AMD, uh, for their workstation stuff, it's still hypertransport, I think. I think. Uh, and then on chip, since, since all of AMD's uh, uh, in intercommunication stuff is done 
with chiplets on a, on a module now, all that interconnect is done with what they call infinity fabric now. And, and that might be something worth bringing up too, is the uh, move in the CPUs to the kind of tiles or chiplet style of uh, manufacture, um, which is definitely changing the way that the CPUs are getting made, uh, both from a manufacturing standpoint and just from like a usability standpoint um, with uh, the addition of like HBM2 memory and different types of um, manufacturing processes all getting put on one chip now. Yeah, that was one of the big pushes in the last Intel forum was the chiplets and how they were going together um, on the SOC type of an application so that that created a lot of uh, scalability and versatility. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, can, you, you don't have to have a die that's, you know, inches square. You can, you can carve off functions and, mm -hmm. and optimize your processes for that function. Optimize it for I.O., optimize it for compute. Mm -hmm. um, it makes for, for a, a, a higher yielding product in the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and I also understand that uh, a lot of these more modern dies for the CPUs have um, encryption kind of built in, mm -hmm. um, encryption engines built in, as well as some of the smaller GPU functionality too. Do you guys want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, so uh, I know one of the new instruction sets, uh, it's, it's built right into the name, is the AES-NI instruction set, which basically accelerates the AES uh, encryption functionality. Um, so that's one way that uh, these CPUs can accelerate crypto functionality. Um, I know they, uh, the newer CPUs also have blocks for doing more than just AES. Um, I'm not super certain what the, the details of those are, but I know that they have uh, new crypto functionality built into them as well. I, I would venture, I guess, they're probably going to end up implementing the full NSA CSNA yep. suite. Hmm. Well, speaking of security, these, uh, these chips have a variety of security functionalities built right into them. Can we talk about that for just a, just a little bit? Sure, so like w one of them is, uh, say, Intel Boot Guard. Um, that's one of the new ones, and um, I, I know there's equivalent processes for the AMD products as well, um, but basically it uh, helps monitor the boot process, um, and, and that utilizes the TPM, which we can talk about here in a little bit, um, to basically verify and measure all of the boot processes from from when you turn the system on to when your operating system presents you like a login screen. Um, basically, it'll go through and verify all of the signatures and hashes are all correct, um, make sure it's all measured correctly, um, so that way if there's any differences, it can raise the flag and say there's something something wrong. So there. it's kind of watching the hardware. Correct. Yeah. Um, it, it's watching the hardware and the software and the firmware stack all kind of together to make sure that it's a uh, verified process. Cool. Uh, I know there was a total memory encryption was one another one of the yeah the total memory encryption I think is really interesting um, basically it's it's encrypting your memory on the device itself and you may question why would you would need to do that it's you know in in your server um, there's a couple different what reasons that you would do that one of them is for these variety of um, hardware attacks that can be done. Um, those are a little extreme probably for most people's use cases. Most of the time you're not worried about someone getting into your computer and freezing your memory and pulling it out and then recovering keys off of it. Mm -hmm. But that's a real attack that uh, people do to it. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would say the, the biggest reason for the encryption is to prevent other processes from accessing the information in the memory. So if I have process A and process B, and I don't want them to communicate with each other. If I encrypt their memory spaces, then they have to have the right keys yep. to read that information out. And so it makes it harder for someone to get a hold of the information using a, a side process, basically. Mm -hmm. Check back for our next podcast as we dive further into the PCH, TPM, and other chips on the motherboard. <laughs>